Bless the name of the Lord. Bless the name of the Lord. A pleasant, pleasant Sabbath afternoon to each and every one of you. We are very thankful uh, for the opportunity to be here at this time, uh, to be able to share uh, the welcoming of the Sabbath together and uh, to continue to praise and to glorify the name of the Lord. So wherever you are, you can just open your mic and say good, uh, good evening to everyone. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Happy God. Sabbath to everyone. Happy Sabbath to you. Thank God. Amen. We're just waiting for a few more to join us as we get ready. For those of you on Facebook, we are also thankful for your Bless presence. Blessed Sabbath. Blessed Sabbath. Blessed Sabbath to you. Blessed Sabbath, everyone. Blessed Sabbath. Blessed Sabbath. Blessed. Amen, 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 amen. So, yes, in a few minutes, we would uh, pray and then we would begin our session tonight, taking you on another level. Amen. I would like you to, at this time, take the time uh, to go to our Facebook page and just share the live, share the live. Let others know that we are on and um, that they can tune in uh, via Facebook and um, to send out the link to others. Amen. Praise the name of the Lord. So just uh, do that for me right now as we get ready to go forward in the name of Jesus. At this time, I invite you to pray with me. At this time, I invite you to pray with me. I invite you to pray with me as we get ready to go into our session tonight, our live session. So wherever you are, bow your head with me as we pray. Bless the Lord. Infinite Father, as we approach your divine presence, it is with immeasurable humility that we seek the wisdom that is within you. We are cognizant of the fact that the shallow depths of our human intellect cannot measure the colossal profoundness of your mind. As we gaze into the infinite windows of your thoughts tonight, we look through, through the lens of your Holy Spirit we know that the works of human authors cannot portray you, that the highest, deepest, broader, broadest flight of our imagination cannot fathom the infinitude of your mind. Heavenly Father, may we behold as we look upon the tapestry of creation, may we see, dear, that there is an infinite or an infinity beyond all that we can comprehend. But through the revelation brought to us by the Holy Spirit, even tonight, we may behold glimmers of your divine glory and of the infinitude, infinitude of knowledge and wisdom that is embodied in your word. We may, O oh God, as it will, take a look on the surface of your infinite thought and know that there is rich golden ore beyond the surface. Father, grant everyone a taste of the great reward that awaits those who seek you tonight. Let us through prayer and the Spirit sing the sharp of our God-given acumen deeper and yet deeper into your infinite mind of truth. Through faith, let your divine knowledge incarnate into human thoughts, opening before us a tiny will 
of that boundless ocean of your infinite knowledge and power that is available to us here tonight through your grace. We pray this prayer by faith in your son, Yeshua, the Messiah. Amen and amen. Bless the Lord. Beloved, we are here. Welcome on each and every one. Brother Curtis, it's good to see you. Brother Hopeton, it's good to see you as well. And to all others, Sister Patrice, it's good to have you on as we wait graciously on the others. So we have been speaking for the last couple of Wednesday and Wednesdays, uh, uh, sorry, on Fridays. Uh, we have been speaking about the second feast, the Feast of Passover. I'm about to take you a little further into that in preparation for what is ahead of us. Now, I want you uh, to particularly understand that I'm not interested so much into, into that of proving a doctrinal position because the word is yea and amen. But I am interested in helping you to understand what you need to do in the celebration of these festivals so that salvation may be experienced by you through them. My goodness. I hope you got that. So pardon me if I should take my time tonight in explaining to you this beautiful festival that is coming up very, very soon. We must be aware for the best part of the world, maybe, that they are in celebration of a pagan festival called Easter that the, the, the Antichrist power, according to Daniel 7.25, is using to supplant the festival of the Passover. It is our responsibility uh, to bring before you and before the world the truth on this matter. And this is what we'll be doing in this service. Now, when I'm finished this week on the uh, Feast of Unleavened Bread and the Passover, I would be then moving to the Feast of First Fruits that will tell you about the truth of the resurrection of Yahshua the truth of his death and the truth of the time that we should celebrate his death and resurrection. And I want to assure you, it will not be the time of Easter. But we have learned over the past couple of weeks that the Passover, based on Exodus chapter 12, is the hovering presence of God over his people. I want to say that again. It is the hovering presence of God over his people. This decision by Jehovah to grace his children with his presence and to hover over them continually is celebrated in the feast of the Passover. In the celebration of the feast, we are called to offer up what is called in Exodus 12, the sacrifice of the Passover. This, that is, offering to God a sacrifice as was told to Israel and they offered up an animal lamb. We are today to still celebrate God's hovering presence. And we are to offer to him a sacrifice, but not the sacrifice of an animal lamb, but the, of the lamb of God, which is his son, Yeshua. In so offering up the sacrifice, we acknowledge his presence, we acknowledge his protection and his watch care as we celebrate the Passover service. Now, as part of the Passover service, we have that of the Feast of Unleavened Bread. Let me be very categorical here. 
the Feast of Unleavened Bread is not a separate feast from the Passover. The Passover takes in from the 14th day of the first month, and it runs right through till the end of the Feast of Unleavened Bread, and that's the entire Passover. That is proven very strongly within the Old and New Testament, and I'll be giving you some of it today. So we are moving in tonight into edifying ourselves by the Spirit of God on that of the spiritual ramifications of the Feast of Unleavened Bread, how it applies to our life today, and how it is so designed by Jehovah through the science thereof to bring victory to us as we celebrate this feast. So as part of, again, I want to emphasize, the Feast of Unleavened Bread is not a separate feast from the Passover, and I'll show you reasons why as we move from forward. Now, as part of the Passover feast held on the 14th day of the first month, there is a seven days Feast of Unleavened Bread. This aspect of the feast, that is the Feast of Passover, begins on the 15th day. So the Passover, the day that the Passover sacrificed, is offered up to God, is on the 14th day, and it is on that day that we celebrate the death of Yeshua. On the 15th day, we celebrate the deliverance that comes as a result of that death of Yeshua. My goodness. Let me go again so you will understand. On the 14th day, we celebrate the death. And through the death of Yeshua, we are protected by the infinite hovering presence of Yehovah. We are protected from the enemy's efforts to slay us. But with that presence comes also deliverance. But deliverance comes the day after, as was shown in Exodus. After they celebrated the celebrated the 14th day by the killing of the lamb, on the 15th day, they left uh, is, uh, Egypt and they celebrated that of their deliverance. Now, this is the day after the eating of the Passover lamb. Jehovah commanded as part of the festival of deliverance and victory that two out of the seven days be set aside as Sabbaths, namely the first day and the seventh day. Let me read this for you in the book of Leviticus, chapter 23, verses 6 through 8. I read in your hearing. And on the 15th day of the same month is the Feast of Unleavened Bread unto the Lord. Seven days ye must eat unleavened bread. Hear the command now because I'm going to show you the application. Seven days ye shall eat unleavened bread. In the first day ye shall have an holy convocation. Ye shall do no servile work therein. But ye shall offer an offering made by fire unto the Lord seven days. In the seventh day is an holy convocation. Ye shall do no work therein. Let me just say to you, beloved listener, that there is a mystical connection between the Passover of the 14th day and the beautiful, impeccable slitter into the seventh day's feast of unleavened bread that connects them together. After experiencing the divine hovering of the presence of Jehovah, which is in itself the Passover, the children of Israel were to exercise faith in his ability not only to protect them from the destroyer, but to deliver them from the bondage that they found themselves in. So we must have faith that, that Jehovah, through the death of his son, has taken us out of the captivity 
that Satan has held us in through sin, but we must also exercise faith in his ability to maintain that position of freedom for the Bible says, if the Son shall set you free, ye are free indeed. If the Son shall make you free, ye are free indeed. You are free indeed, meaning that your freedom from sin, as was the freedom from Egyptian bondage, is permanent. Somebody say amen. It is permanent. Don't matter what the devil should try. He has been trying for years to take the children back to Egyptian bondage, but there has always been a faithful people that Satan will never put back in bondage. And so it amen, is. Amen, amen. There will always be a faithful few who will not be taken back into the bondage of paganism, the bondage of sin, because we are living daily under the hoovering, delivering power of Jehovah. Somebody say amen. And so, amen. And so, this deliverance would come. And has come. It came for them not on the 14th day, but on the 15th, according to the record. The Bible says in Exodus 12, 17, listen carefully. And they departed from Ramesses in the first month on the 15th day of the month. On the morrow after the Passover, the children of Israel went out with an high hand in the sight of the Egyptians. In Numbers 33 and verse 3, we are told, And ye shall observe the feast of unleavened bread, for in this selfsame day have I brought your enemy, your, your armies, out of the land of Egypt. Therefore shall ye observe this day in your generation by an ordinance forever. Now let's step back here a little bit. For those of you who are bright, and I know we have some bright people here, and I'm not talking tongue in cheeks here. I mean that. Why is God saying that you should celebrate your, your deliverance? Why did he tell the, Israel, the Israelites this? Why did he leave it for us to celebrate our deliverance on this 15th day? Listen carefully. The reason for that is, the 15th day, on the 15th day of, of the first month, the Feast of Ha, unleavened bread, begins. What Jehovah understood, and we are revealing to you now, is that there is a science involved in the Feast of Unleavened Bread that starts on the 15th day, that is sine qua non to our deliverance from sin and our staying delivered from sin. I hope you got that. So when we begin to celebrate this feast on the 15th day, the Holy Spirit will reveal to us the science that will give us victory and keep us victorious. That's why he says celebrated on the 15th day. You see, God never does anything for formality. But oftentimes, because we are not connected to the Holy Spirit and we are only academic in our endeavor as we read the word, we cannot find the truth. But when we begin to have a relationship with him, he will lift us ab above the superficiality of academics and put us into the glorious, glorious uh, mountaintop of divine revelation so that we may be able to grasp more from what we read on that low plane. Therefore, I say to you, the Passover of the 14th and the sacrifice of the Passover tells us of Jehovah's protective power over those who accept the sacrifice that he had made for them as the eternal spirit 
and climax at Calvary. It is only by accepting, hear me out well, and applying the blood, which is the divine life of God. I've got to say that again because people have made a mockery of the whole lesson of the blood. And people think that this, the applying of the blood is some physical, physical thing you do and you start to apply blood. But let me tell you something. The applying of the blood simply symbolizes and represents the fact that you are able to consciously make a decision to follow the science revealed by Jehovah in his word concerning how his son Yeshua got life by depending on the divine spirit. Apply that to your life. When you do that, you are applying the blood. Talk to me, somebody. And so, it is only by accepting and applying the blood, which is the life of Jehovah, that the believer can procure the protection of the presence of Jehovah. In the celebration of the Feast of Passover today, the believer, you and I, will express our faith in the hoovering presence and power of God. This is this in itself is only the beginning of the work. For after being protected from the devil and granted deliverance from his power, one must be able to maintain such a position. This work of maintaining victory over the devil and sin is what is brought out in the gospel science of the seven-day feast of unleavened bread. This gospel science that is wrapped up in the seven-day feast of unleavened bread is called in the New Testament sanctification. What is it called? Sanctification. So the Greeks found a beautiful word to express it, sanctification. But the word, because I've told you several times that the Greeks... They deal with words that are abstract. You've got to go back to the Hebrew teachings of the Torah so that you can find concrete examples of how this thing work. So sanctification, a beautiful words, a beautiful word used by the Greeks in the New Testament. But when you want to understand the science and the function of sanctification, you've got to go back to the Torah. That's what we are doing as we examine the Feast of Unleavened Bread. Oh my goodness. This is just getting sweeter and better for me. And I'm hoping that as we drink from the beautiful fountain of truth tonight, that you are beginning to experience the lovely, lovely blessings that is coming to you from the well of salvation. Now, the reason why the Feast of Unleavened Bread and the Feast of Passover is tied together, listen to this well, as one is because, listen, the lesson in the Bible. When Israel left Egypt on the 15th day of the first month, Jehovah's overing presence that came upon them on the 14th did not deserve them. This was demonstrated by the presence of the pillar of fire and the cloud that followed them throughout their journey. So the hoven presence is not something that should come and remove, be removed. So when, as God's people, we come on the 14th day to celebrate the Passover, the hovering presence of God, that we have as a result of the death of the Lamb of God, Yeshua, be it known that when we finish that celebration on the 14th day of the first month, it doesn't mean that it is that that's the end of it and God is gone. He will continue 
to hoover over us, and so on a daily basis, we partake of the emblems that represents his hoovering presence through the death of his son, that is the bread and the wine. We will talk further on that matter. So yes, the Bible tells us in Exodus 13, verses 21 and 22, I read in your hearing. And the Lord went before them by day in a pillar of cloud and lead them the, and lead them the way, and by night in a pillar of fire to give them light to go by the day and night. He took not away, hear the words now, he took not away the pillar of the cloud by day nor the pillar of the fire by night from before the people. So we, so what we are seeing here is Jehovah's willingness to let his presence remain with us, not only at the point of time appointed by Jehovah for the festival, but throughout our lifetime, if we should maintain our relationship with him. This also demonstrates that the Passover experience and celebration was not to be a one-off experience and celebration, but a continuous experience in the lives of those who would today take their journey from the sweltering heat of sin to the oasis of the promised land. Yes, beloved. Having gained deliverance and victory through the Passover, that's the death of Yeshua, there is a need to maintain the status quo. The celebration of the Feast of Passover contains the gospel science that will give the believer the ability to walk in the victory given through the hovering presence of Yehovah. Part of God's instruction for the days of unleavened bread is, hear this now, we, we're entering into the science here now. Put leaven products out of your homes, Exodus 12, 15, and 16. This we must do in a concrete way. When we celebrate the feast coming up later in this month, we must put all leaven products out of our homes. So, according to Exodus 12, 15, and 16, I read, it says, seven days shall he eat unleavened bread. Even the first day he shall put away leaven out of the house. For whosoever eateth leavened bread from the first day until the seventh day, that shoal shall be cut off from among Israel. Now, not only were we called upon to put away leaven, but he first called upon, upon us to eat leaven. Let me read the text again. Let me read again this wonderful truth. In Exodus 12, 15 and 16, seven days shall he eat unleavened bread. I need to immediately unfold the science here, and I will repeat it later on. Understand, beloved, that we cannot get sin rid of sin in our lives by making a decision to stop sinning. In order to get rid of sin, we have to feast on righteousness. We've got to eat the word of God daily. That's what the, the feast is telling us. When it says seven days shall he eat unleavened bread, the seven day represents perfection or completion. God is saying to us that except we eat of the word of God, of the righteousness of Christ on a daily basis, sin will never be eradicated from our lives. But we got to take conscious decision to eat and to remove sin, to eat righteousness and remove sin. Let me get that very clear in your mind. This is what is brought out during the Feast of Unleavened Bread. You've got to make a conscious decision to partake of the righteousness of Christ, which is the word of God. 
then you've got to make a conscious decision to search your house, your spiritual temple, as you will ex as you will so uh, do to your physical house to search it for every ounce of leaven and have it removed. Bless the name of the Lord. This is the spiritual lesson and the spiritual science that is involved in the celebration of the Feast of Unleavened Bread. Now, remember I said to you that this is the work of sanctification. If you want to be sanctified, you've got to make a conscious effort to search yourself and by the power of the indwelling word, remove every jot and tittle of sin from the life. And this is a work of a lifetime. Yes, beloved. And so, yes, the Feast of Unleavened Bread is a festival that helps us to focus on replacing sin with righteousness. But the only real way to put sin out of our lives is to consistently participate in the bread, in the body and blood of Yeshua. So now, indeed, the comparison and the science of this feast is glaring even in the New Testament. Let me just share that with you. I need to share these points with you if you, you would take your questions later. So write them down as I go through. In the Feast of Unleavened Bread, Unleavened bread is to be eaten for seven days. This celebrates and symbolizes the reality that we are constantly to feast on the living word, which is Yeshua in the person of the Holy Spirit. B, in the Feast of Unleavened Bread, all leaven must be removed from the house. This is a celebration and symbolism of the work of what feasting upon the living word would do eradicate sin from the life of those who truly keep the feast. See, in the Feast of Unleavened Bread, the first and seventh day are to be Sabbaths. This is a celebration and a symbolism of the rest that would be experienced by all who consistently partake of the bread of life. This is beautiful. Beloved, the science in the Feast of Unleavened Bread is found in the words of the Messiah in Matthew 26, 26, and in Mark 14, 22. That is Matthew 26, 26, and Mark 14, 22. It says, and as they were eating, Jesus took bread and blessed it and break it and gave it to his disciples and said, take, eat, this is my body. Now I want you to follow me carefully here now, because we do this every day, and we do this on the Sabbath, and we'll be doing it through the festivals. The blessed bread and the wine was given to the church as a medium. Hear my words now. It was a medium of the body and blood of Christ. The medium is the bread and the wine. Whatever the body and blood is, is the reality. I'm taking my time here. I'm moving slowly. Hear this again. The bread and the wine is the medium. Through the medium, the church is to connect to the reality. If you are ignorant of the reality, the bread... Partaking of the bread and the wine would be a formality. Hear this again. The bread and the wine is the medium. But the medium is there to connect you to the reality. If you are ignorant of what the reality is, you will not be able to embrace it when the Holy Spirit seeks to bring it to you after you have partaken of the medium. Okay? I'm about to explain that in detail for you. Brother Horace, if it is really something you want to get clear, then I'll take your questions 
because I don't want your question, because I don't want you to maybe lose the thought, but I want you to go with me with this um, step by step. This is something you want clear. clear. Go ahead. Well, I can I can wait until later on. You can wait. So write down your question and I will take it then. Okay. Okay. Praise God. Now, God given symbols. We have not been taught as Seventh day Adventists to appreciate symbols. As a matter of fact, we have been subconsciously taught to fear them. To fear them. Because the church has engaged no symbols at all. Maybe except one pagan one, which is the cross. The media pulpits looking like them and all of these things. But we have not been taught to appreciate symbols. Symbols have always been a part of God's worship system. <clears throat> we can see it from the garden with the tree of knowledge of good and evil and the tree of life. They were symbols connecting Adam and Eve to a reality. We can see it in the Ark of the Covenant, a symbol that was used to connect to a reality. I can go on and on to show you throughout the scriptures, even within the New Testament. You doubt it? You have the oil as, a, as an anointing oil. That's a symbol connecting you to a reality. I can go on and on. There has always has always been a biblical position for God to manifest his power to his people through symbols. So God given symbols are mediums. A medium is anything used to convey or transmit something. But the thing it conveys or transmits is the reality. This is the function of the bread and the wine in the service of the Feast of Passover and the Seventh-day Feast of Unleavened Bread. It is meant to be vessels, that's the bread and the wine, through which the body and blood of Yeshua is passed to his church. The Messiah said, this is my body, this is my blood. Why did he not say this represents my body and it represents my blood? The reason why he didn't say it represents is this. The medium, when it is used, becomes so integral to the reality that it is often referred to as the reality. This is my body. This is my blood. Understanding, beloved, what the body and blood of Christ is will enable the believer to the believer to partake with greater faith. As such, it is crucial that these two realities be clearly defined. Now, before I move in there, when the church leaves the members at the foot of the representation, they rob the church of the reality. So they, they emphasize the point the bread and the wine is just a representation. It's not really the body and blood of Christ. Well, then why did Christ say that? And they do that because they do not understand. I am hoping that by the Spirit of God tonight, as we delve into the mind of God through the Holy Spirit, we would be able to have a greater sense of appreciation for the word of his son, Yeshua the Messiah. Let's begin by unfolding what the body and blood of Christ is so that we would be enabled to partake on a daily basis at your homes, collectively on the Sabbath, and especially during the festivals, with a greater level of faith because our knowledge have been increased. In John chapter 6, in John chapter 6, from verse 31, a clear explanation is given to us concerning the body and blood of Yeshua, what it really is. Let us read. I hope you have your Bibles nearby. I begin. 
it says, Our fathers did eat manna in the desert, as it is written. He gave them bread from heaven to eat. Then Jesus said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Moses gave you not that bread from heaven, but my Father giveth you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is he. Stop there. For the bread of God is he. Watch the pronoun there. Is he which cometh down from heaven and giveth his life to the world. So watch what it is said. Said here, for the bread of God is he which cometh down from heaven. This statement is very profound, beloved, very profound, for it categorically states that the bread of Yehovah comes down, came down from heaven. This, therefore, clarifies that the bread is not the Son of Man. The Son of Man did not come from heaven. It is the Son of God. The Son of Man came from Mary having the lineage that came and can be traced through the 14 generations from Adam to David. This is according to Matthew chapter 1. In John 6.63 states that the bread of God is he which cometh down from heaven and giveth life unto the world. The one that came down from heaven, who is the bread of life, is a quickening spirit. This is according to 1 Corinthians 15, 45, and 46. I hope you're taking your notes. The bread of God is none other than the Son of God. God in the person of the Holy Spirit. Now, notice what I'm telling you. The Son of God is not flesh and blood. The Son of God is the Holy Spirit itself. Amen. To partake of the bread is to partake of, the, of divinity in the form of the Holy Spirit. It is to eat of the Lamb of God that taketh away the sins of the world in blindness of the formality of present-day Christianity. These mysteries are kept hidden as it was to the Jews of Yeshua's days. In the following scripture, the Jews demonstrated the illiteracy of spiritual things as they listened to the Messiah. Hear the words now. Hear the words well here now. Then said they unto him, Lord, evermore give us this bread. And Jesus said unto them, I am the bread of life. Hear his words. I am the bread of life. He that cometh to me shall never hunger. And he that believeth on me shall never thirst. The Jews, therefore, the Jews then murmured at him, because he said, I am the bread which came down from heaven. And they said, Is not this Jesus, the son of Joseph, whose father and mother we know? How is it then that he said, I came down from heaven? The Jews, beloved, like Christianity today, were only able to see the medium. Most people take the bread and the wine and they see the medium. They could not behold the reality that the medium was conveying. I don't want this to happen to you. They saw the son of man. He was the medium. But the son of man was only the medium. The conduit through which the reality the Son of God can be communicated to the human race. The Messiah continues, I am the bread of life. Your fathers did eat manna in the wilderness and are dead. This is the bread that cometh down from heaven, that a man may eat thereof and not die. I am the living bread which came down from heaven. If any man eat of this bread, he shall live forever. And the bread that I will give is my flesh, which I will give for the life of the world. John 6, 48 to 51. Beloved, the Messiah was here referring to his divinity. That is, God himself that was dwelling in him. But as they could not see beyond the lamb, so they could not see beyond the symbol of his humanity. 
so most of Christianity cannot see beyond the symbol of the bread and the wine. Those who reject the feast are ceremonial and therefore irrelevant to the church today will continue to eat bread and wine in what they call the communion service, but will never partake of the reality of the divine nature of Jehovah. And the bread that I will give is my flesh, he said. This is saying, beloved, that a person, anyone, can have no access to the reality except they access the reality through the medium of his humanity. Matthew 26, 26. Let's talk a little. It says to us, and as they were eating, Yeshua took bread and blessed it and break it and gave it to his disciples and said, take it, this is my body. In another scripture, the Messiah says, Jesus said unto him, I am the way, the truth and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me, John 14, 6. The way, the truth and the life is the oneness, hear me out well, the way, the truth, and the life is the oneness that was existing between the humanity and the divinity of Christ. The way, the truth, and the life represents the divine science that was embodied in the mystery of godliness, God dwelling in the flesh. This is true also of the medium of the bread and the wine. This is the science that is found in the Feast of Unleavened Bread. Hear me now. Hear me now. When you partake of the bread, your faith must take hold of the divine spirit dwelling in the bread and in the wine. Let me say it again. Now notice, nothing is said here of the bread and the wine changing into anything. It is bread and it is wine. And it is bread and wine always. But within these symbols, within these emblems, God in the person or form of the spirit for physical things do not hinder the dwelling of the Holy Spirit in them. So God is saying, I will take up a bowl in the form of the Spirit, in the form of my Holy Spirit, in the bread and the wine. But you will access that only if your faith takes hold of this reality. My goodness. And so the, the Bible says the Jews show up among themselves, saying, how could he give us his flesh to eat? Because they couldn't understand. That is in John 6, 52 to 56. They couldn't understand when he said to them, except to eat my the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, he have no life in you. Whosoever eateth my flesh and drinketh my blood had eternal life, and I will raise him up in the last day. They didn't understand that, that Jesus was telling them, if you want eternal life, you've got to look into my humanity and see and embrace the science that exists that caused my humanity to be perfectly united with the Holy Spirit, my divinity, and cause my humanity to live spotless. This is the science, beloved. Amen. And so, as you prepare for this glorious feast of unleavened bread, this glorious feast of Passover and unleavened bread, I want you to grasp this science tonight. Amen. I want you not only to wait on that time of the feast, but I want you to understand that every single day that you bring your religion, your system of worship, 
outside the four walls of what we call the church and bring it into your homes and into your life. Every day that you pour wine and you break bread and you bless it in your family circle and you partake of it, look at what you are partaking of, the divine life. The life that Yeshua said, except you eat and you drink, there is no life in us. Let us therefore be sure that we prepare ourselves for this great feast coming up. I, I, I'm hoping I'm doing justice to this, oh God. That we are preparing for this great feast, but help that at the present time, we may partake in our daily participation and in our weekly participation every Sabbath and in our yearly participation in the festivals of the blood body and blood of Yeshua. I hope I was clear to you. Amen. I want to give you the time now to get your questions in. I'm, I'm, I'm opening up. Please take the opportunity to have it clear in your minds. And if there's any question, then feel free. By next week, I will be moving into the third feast, and uh, that is this, the feast of first food, celebrating the resurrection of our Lord. Amen. Who wants to ask their questions? Come on. Bless the Lord. I love when the church has questions to ask, or at least comments to me. It helps me to feel comfortable that I have really explained this clearly and that you understand because... It is the Bible says, this is life eternal, that he might know. I cannot leave you ignorant. I can't, I don't want even to have the feelings that have left you ignorant. And so you have to help me to eliminate that feelings because I want to be sure that I've made it clear to you. Come on, let me hear your questions. Brother Harris, now is the time. And any other person, feel free. Sister Gabby, look for those online on Facebook who may have their questions, and please get them over to me. Good night, Bishop. Good night, good night. I understand fully the bread and the wine, what it represents to me. Right. It's not, a, it's not about literally eating Yeshua body or drinking his blood, but this is the spiritualness and the reality. Yes. So the more I eat and drink of it, he dwell in me and I dwell in him. So the Holy Spirit himself is in within. Yes. The symbol. Right? Amen, 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 amen. Bless the Lord. Who's next? Who's next? Who's next? Let's get it going. I see iPhone, I see your mic is on. If you have a question, go ahead. Uh, I'm going to take it off, Bishop. It's better, Andy. I'm going to take it off. Oh, it's better, Andy. Okay, Andy. Okay. Sister Angel, I'm happy to see you on tonight. Welcome. And thank God, I'm happy, really happy to see you with us tonight. If you have any questions, feel free to ask. If you have any comments, feel free to ask. Lenovo, we thank God to have you. If you have any questions, feel free to ask as well. But Rodney, we thank God for you. Sister Donna, I'm always happy to have your questions in. If you have anything you want clarified, feel free to do so uh, tonight. Bishop. Yes. You know, when we were studying the sun, represented by God's, well, God's son and the, the son of God and the son of man. Yes. I realized that I used to say, but I understand it. Why, you know, um, I don't, under, I was thinking to myself, how come people wouldn't understand that the son of God is who died for us? Mm -hmm. But now when Easter comes around, and I see them literally taking a man and have him carrying a cross. Mm -hmm. Then it comes so clear mm -hmm. the point how 
mankind, the religious world, worshipping the man yes. who as the son of man and not understanding that it was the son of God yes. who died on our behalf. And everybody so, see it, I'm like, oh my goodness, I see it now so clearly. Yeah, it yeah. has to be brought forth. Yes. So as I stand and to help people understand that it is not the son of man who came as flesh, but the son of God. Yes. That's beautiful. But if you understand that they wouldn't have a man carrying a cross. Correct. Correct. And, and that is just pure idolatry. Because you would notice that during this whole festival of Easter that they have, there is no mention of the Son of God experiencing death on our behalf. There is no explanation yeah. of this whole thing. It is just the idolizing of a man and 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 we and every year they are going over the same uh, routine. And it's just dead formalism, beloved. Yes, and so, it is. so it is. if we do not develop that sense of appreciation for what the Son of God experienced, as you rightly said, it was the it was the Son of God experience. It was the Son of Man dying, but it was the Son of God experiencing death that brought salvation to us in its fullest sense. Amen. Yes, and you know, to carry it even further is that with the understanding that it was the Son of God who, who died for us. It, yes. The sense is that the religious world will understand that there is only one God. Because, if, if it is that, because of that point, that it continue to have this man yes. that they have carrying the cross, yes. that they have three gods. Yes. Yes, three gods. Correct. They correct. There is only one God. That's and correct. the Son of God being God yes. is the one who came yes. and sacrificed on our behalf. Hence, they could never understand that there's only one God and, and, and the Christian world today cannot explain the people like Muslim and so forth, that there is only one God. Yes. They say it, but they cannot explain it. Because how can you, when you have a man representing the one who died on your behalf? Amen. And you see, you see, that type of teaching of the Trinity, it 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 panders to that of the four other false teachings of Roman Catholicism. Um, because in so doing uh, that and, and claiming that there is there is there is this trinity of gods uh, then they can also they can also support other things in their doctrines in their doctrine that is contrary uh, to scripture so it is not something that they want to give up uh, very just like that and another time we'll talk some more on that. But I, I really want you to, to really focus in on um, connecting um, with the body and blood of Christ, which is that connection that comes with the, 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 the Holy Spirit dwelling within you. That's the eating of the body and blood of Yeshua, as mentioned in the Holy Scripture. And I hope that um, in that in this explanation, it is clear to you and it will mean something to you as you go forward. Anybody else? Yeah, Bishop. Go ahead. Yeah, the, 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 A little louder for me. I'm not hearing. Yeah. Where the Jews and them told um, Jesus that we know your father and your mother. Yeah. Right? Isn't the, the son of Mary and Joseph, right? Yeah. So the Jews and them was clear that a man couldn't be good. Yes. Yes, it right. was clear. It was clear in that aspect. All right, but I, and that he but, didn't but, come down from heaven, and he and he didn't come down from heaven. Mm -hmm. So it was clear. But the Christian world today, right, immortalized the man because they immortalized the woman, which is Mary. Yes, because if, if Mary had to be a god to make a god. Yes. I, 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 and she couldn't. She could only make a man. Yes. Right? 
So if you notice in the Catholic Church, they also worship Mary. Yes. As the holy thing, although right. the Bible say that. Meaning to say that they put divinity on Mary. Therefore, the son that she make, she Jesus Christ, have that same divinity that, that he get from his mother. And mm -hmm. with all of that, they leave out God out of the picture. Correct. And and you know, so worship, I'm the coming the worship, the worship the mother yes. and the son. And and in brother, that now you find, Brother Bilton, that um the whole doctrine of the whole character of God is is really um spinned into something that people forget God because the Catholic teaching, uh whether directly or indirectly, is that Mary is the one that appeases God through her son, Jesus Christ. Now, what they were really saying in that teaching is that God is not a merciful God. God is not a kind God. God wants to burn everybody, put them in hell, cause them to suffer. God wants to do that. But Jesus comes in between and, and beg God not to do it. And Jesus do it, come and beg God not to do it because his mother asked him to do it. And that's the real, that's the real onslaught upon God. Now they have to do that. The, 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 to, to keep up that type of teaching, they have to have a trinity. Because if it is that God is one God, then it would mean that the, that the one who sacrificed himself, himself for us or to save us is God. And therefore, mm -hmm. therefore, it will eliminate it all that God is a big bad wolf and doesn't want to save us and uh, have no mercy on us. So they keep up the Trinity teaching so that they could support those other kind of false doctrines. Amen. Yeah, and you know, it's for years exactly that that people believe yes. that the that the, the mother and the son is more merciful than God than the Father. That, yes, that, that the Father. Yeah. So we, we you don't want to fall into the hands of the father. But yes. you understand? So, yes. so, the, so the, son, the son is right there on our behalf. Correct. And that is how that is how a lot of people understand Christianity. Correct. That God is not yes. really on their side. Correct. That's true. Sister Myrtle. Myrtle Thomas. Yes, yeah, so get your question in the next few minutes. This is the shaman. You go I, ahead. Yeah, I'm here. I'm here. Right. Yeah. Um this might be a strange question, but um is there anything to the man Christ Jesus that should be we should be thankful to? And is there anything about the man Christ Jesus himself that even how can I say that kind of even for lack of a better word, exist because of how the, the whole setting up of, of God dwelling in him and and the purpose of the whole incarnate of how uh the overshadowing of Mary. Is there anything about the man Christ Jesus that even will exist in heaven or we owe any kind of thanks to? Everything. Everything about a man, Christ Jesus, would be exist in heaven. Everything about him would be appreciated and is appreciated. But what sacrifices? What did he? What did he do? We 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 know what God to him experienced and what the whole setting up was. The what son of God. What did the he do? The son of God dwelt to him. Yes. What, what did he do? He surrendered his will. He surrendered his will to God. And that was a choice he had to make as a man. And therefore we must be eternally thankful that as a man, he did what he did. So if he did not surrender his will, this whole thing couldn't happen. Well, I'll tell you this. I do, those type of uh, close question to God 
Mm -hmm. I, I don't like to address because okay. God is saying, I came to save man. And if there was one man who did not allow me to surrender, to, did not surrender their will uh, mm -hmm. for me to use them, I would use another man. No, that, yeah, that's well, that's, that's, that's. So, so, so the question you're asking there. Would that happen with him then? Huh? It would not have happened with him. Not that, it, not that I don't mean that God's whole plan would have gone to north. I mean, right. it would not happen with him. Good. So it means, and that's why the man represented humanity. And so when he made the decision to, to surrender uh, to divinity, to take full control of his life, he did that on behalf of man. You get that? So he will be in heaven. He will be looked <clears throat> as, he will be looked upon as the son of God and the, the man Christ Jesus. That's definitely so. Mm -hmm. okay. Amen. Okay. And uh, people would be able to appreciate him as man. Mm -hmm. And then worship him as uh, God. Uh, you get that? Yeah. Yeah. So let me say it again, not just for you, but for everybody. People throughout eternity would be able to appreciate Yeshua as man and worship him as God, because he would be both God and man. He was both God and man, and he will continue to be. Amen. And so, that is the whole thing that the Jewish nation could not accept. That not have seen. Yes. 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 Yeah. Brother Horace, Sister Sharon. Yes, Bishop. Um, back in the days when they wrote the Bible, um, you think there was paganism at that time? Oh, and the, reason, the reason why I ask is because in Acts 12, verse 4, it mentioned the word Easter, mm -hmm. but in the third, the third verse, it clearly stated that it was the days of unleavened bread. Right. But they 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 turn over Peter to the soldiers, and they said it's until after the the after Easter. Right. Oh, the, well, the question you ask is definitely, um, if there was ever a figure, this would have been at around that time, and it continued way before that there was um, paganism. But apart from paganism, it tells you how uh, the Europeans try to uh, manipulate the Bible uh, to suit uh, their pagan teachings. Um, and so forth. So, uh, yes, there, that, that word was never supposed to be there. But the fact that God allowed it to be there states that it stands as a witness to show that that Passover is still to be kept. The word doesn't, doesn't remove the truth that Passover is to be kept, although they try to slip in a pagan word by the name of Easter. Amen. Amen. Because they, are, they had stated clearly uh, that it's the days of unleavened bread. Correct, and that was uh, that was after Christ uh, died on the cross. Amen. Amen. Right, Sister Cheryl. Um, with the question that Sister Sharmin asked, you know, I know you answered it and everything when you said that um the importance of the Son of Man is when he he surrendered, right? Which is true, and that's the whole plan of salvation. But just to go on even a little further, which is one and the same, is that um, if it wasn't for the wasn't for the son of man, that's how important he is. The plan of salvation where where God died, it would have been of no effect because remember, it's the son of man that passed on that feeling of the for the expert for the son of God to experience. Death. So the son of God couldn't die. Because he couldn't die. That's what I'm saying. He couldn't die. So I think that is one of the most important. It, I mean, everything about it is important, but just to know that the son of man died. How important his death was and right. even his life. Right. right? Because he passed on that to the son of God, as it would have been of non-effect. 
Right. Because God couldn't die. So let so me just explain very, something. Very, very important. Let me explain something, Sister Cheryl. And I'm not referring, I'm not uh, directing it at any person. Mm -hmm, right. There's a certain level, level of fear that when we give the Son of God what should rightfully belong to him, that we are not giving something to the Son of Man. True, true. That, that fear has to move, beloved. Man, God could have used any man. Any man. There's nothing specifically special about that man. Any man that God went into, that's why you represent the all of humanity. Mankind. Every, mankind. Any man that God went into, he would have gotten the result that he got from the man Christ Jesus. That's the power of divinity. Yes. And, and therefore, we, we must not feel guilty for giving to the Son of Man the full glory for of what course. Jesus experienced. Yes. We must not feel that we are doing something wrong by play, pull, by, by showing the full, giving the full attention to what the Son of God did that resulted in the perfect life of the Son of Man. We mustn't feel guilty for that. Bishop? Amen. I just wanted to make that. I'm not saying somebody is doing that. If, if you, you don't have to respond to that if it's that you're going to. But I'm just saying we must not feel that level of guilt. None of us, and that's something that I recognize throughout as the study become more and more clear to us. Bishop, mm -hmm. you said, and I'm not trying to push this any away from the topic, but you said that God, well, what you were just saying in the end is that God could have, that it could have been that any man, any human man oh, really? could have been used. But then if, if any man could have been used, where does the overshadowing in preparation fall? Sure, so it just has to be something, something. Just now, Sister Shaman. Yes. Just now. Listen good. God was looking to use humanity. Yes. Not a specific man. He was looking to use humanity. But the way how humanity is structured, he had to... He ha it will come out in a man. Mm -hmm. So God work in in the man Christ Jesus was not with a man, was with humanity. Un understood, but, right. but but before the overshadowing or anything, I, I am I to understand that there was nothing special about Mary, nothing special about Joseph. Nothing different in the life. Why they were what, chosen to bring for this? No, what? What? No, salvation. in the context, just now, special, but not in the context of of salvation, of 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 what it takes for salvation. Amen. Special in the sense that they lived right, they kept yeah. themselves pure, they kept themselves obedient. Special in that sense, but not in the sense of what is was needed in the context of salvation so anybody let's say any husband and wife that had kept themselves like mary and joseph did could have been chosen mary and joseph represents any human being who kept themselves god didn't choose them because something specific with them but mm -hmm. because yeah. of the purity that they held themselves in it could have been john and Janet, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you understand what I'm saying? Yeah. And mm -hmm. all God needed was um, somebody who was part of humanity mm -hmm. that was keeping themselves pure enough that he could come and them. work yeah. through them. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's all he needed. Mm -hmm. so, 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 so that's that's a mistake that Catholics make. They they try to make it like if Mary. But me, the Bible talks yeah. about carrying her sin offering and so forth. And they try mm -hmm. to make it look like if she was somebody special, Too special yeah. to everybody else, and so God came and used her. Mm -hmm. The fact is that if anyone walked pure as Mary walked and keep themselves not sinless, 
because she wasn't, but she was in 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 a in a enough pure relationship with God that he could have used her. And she wasn't the first person. You go back to Old Testament time, you'll see many others. Enoch walked with God 300 years. So people have been living life of purity long before that time. Wait, Mary and this might be seems like a silly question. Mary and Joseph, they were married or they weren't? Was it? They, at the time of her, at the, at the time at of the, her, uh, her pregnancy, they were not officially married. They weren't officially married yet. No, no. but that's another story we can go into. You have to understand mm -hmm. that when a man espoused a woman in that day, it is different yeah, just now. Married, they were yeah. dating. They were counted yeah. as being married. But if he found yeah. her to be unclean in any way, he had the privilege of putting her away. And the Holy Spirit tell him, don't do it. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's another story. Mm -hmm. Praise God. So are you, I'm, I'm hoping, so could somebody open your mics again and help me? Are you grasping um, the, the significance and the importance of this festival as it relates to the Passover and your eleven bread? Could somebody just, you don't have to go into explain nothing, just tell me if you are. Um, yes, I um, Bishop. Yes. Bishop. Bishop. Yes, go ahead. Let's go, go ahead. Somebody speaking. Um, a, a, a quick question, you might be able to answer it very, very fast. What if you live in a household that is not under this whole thing when you were talking about putting away the bread out of your house and, and stuff like like that? What if you live in a household that is not, does not, you know, right. celebrate the Passover? Okay, so let's, let me tell you something. To every single person have been granted um a, 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 a portion of what is called personal space. Yes. And you use your personal space to carry out the same principle. You get that? Mm -hmm. Right. You use your personal space to carry out the same principle. So if you're living in a house and your personal space is your bedroom, then you carry out the principle within that bedroom. Amen? Okay. Right. It's easy. It's not hard. God is not trying to get us to be exacting and use that exactingness to be our righteousness. So God just wants to see that we are willing and obedient and accepts our our effort as righteousness. So if so, if I, I you, uh, you may find that you, I don't know. I hope you don't find that I'm pushing this very far. So your personal space is free of leavened bread. What if you are working outside of for those days of um, Passover and you're working outside of that, let's say at the daycare and you have to, the, in this daycare, the kids are fed uh, bread and, or in a school where you yeah. prepare lunch and what, what, what do you do? You see, and what, God does, what God doesn't want eating. from you mm -hmm. is, is, is that of straining an, at a nap and swallowing a camel. The, the, mm -hmm. the beauty and power of this is not uh -huh. it being legalistic. It is in understanding the science and embracing it. I and do, you, yes. And when you have anomalies, it doesn't change that. Okay, so what I want from you is a simple answer to me. Like, if, if it, let's say, work-wise to the regular thinking person, Work-wise, you have to deal with things like leavened bread. Would that be held against you? That is simply what I wanted to know. That by, answer, by, you, that by answer, you dealing with it. No, that answer I would not give. The reason why I would not give is because I don't want, and I'm not saying you're doing this, eh? I don't want to become the Holy Spirit to anybody because right. for them to say, pastor say, and therefore I feel comfortable. I am giving the truth and the person must be able to understand that truth and feel comfortable based on the truth, not based on what I say. So I understand your simple question, Sister Shabin, but I would not be given, not that I cannot, I'm just saying I would not. I cherish the work of the Holy Spirit. I cherish hiding myself behind the cross. I, I cherish not being seen as the one who 
whose word brings a comfort to a person in the decisions they have to make by the Holy Spirit. So I'm saying, here what is the answer to that? Your responsibility is to grasp the lesson of connecting to the reality. Whatever anomalies that come up, beloved, you, will, you, you feel comfortable as you are guided by the Holy Spirit. Amen? Later on in, in, your, in your Christian experience, you'll say, I thank God, Pastor Thomas, and some of that, those that we, not only you, others as well. Brother Horace. Yes, sir. Go ahead. I, I didn't have a question. Oh, okay, all right. <laughs> so yes, beloved, um, I hope that you are understanding this. I hope you're taking it seriously. And I hope you're doing all within your powers to make sure, not only on these festivals, but on a daily basis, that the partaking of the emblems of the bread and the wine gives you that place where your faith takes hold of the reality and be sanctified in the name of Yahweh. Amen? If there's no other question, we would now get ready to pray. And I'm um, just giving you another two minutes. If there's any other, any other at all, feel free. Next week, as I said, we are now moving to the gospel of the of the feast of uh, of resurrection, the feast of fruit sweet. You don't want to miss that. I have a question, Bishop. Sure. In the garden of Gethsemane with Jesus, when Satan and his demonic agents brought everything to him, he cried out to his father and asked him if it's his will not is about three times to take the bitter cup from him, right? Mm -hmm. On on the course now, he could not see beyond the portal or the tomb, which in he had stayed, if he had destroyed this temple, he would have raised it up in three days. Mm -hmm. But when he cried out to God and asked God that, but God was right there in the dark Lord. So in every situation, he was already sealed from in the garden of Gethsemane before he reached on the cross. If he was already... Seal in the Garden of Gethsemane. And, and yes, I think, uh, if I'm not mistaken, the Bible states that he was sealed. And so because he was sealed, uh, when he reached to the cross and he couldn't see beyond the portal of the tomb, he was not, um, the devil was not able to get him to change his mind. And that's what the sealing work is going to do for us. When yes. we reach to that place where we cannot see that, that when we do not have a mediator, uh, when we have to live in the sight of God without a mediator, we must be fully sealed so that nothing that happens would be able to, to change us. Amen. Amen. Bless the name of the Lord. Is there a question for right? Um, but uh, it's yes, not a question. Ahead. Yes, Just go quickly. ahead. Um, when when it, when I when it was um speaking earlier on and you said the science of our deliverance and our staying delivered, right? Mm -hmm. And it says by applying the blood of the Son of God, which we know that is the um life, life of Christ, of which we yes. know is to the bread and the wine, right? Mm -hmm. I it just when I saw that thing, it, it it brought me back now to the point where why it is we ought to be taking the bread and the wine daily. Because when we take it as some people say at at like let's just say one time for the oh, for the month or three times for the a quarter, we are just um um fulfilling the part of of us of, of, of our deliverance. Mm -hmm. But for us to, to to stay delivered, it's a daily something, and therefore right. I watch it as that. Now, when yeah. we have to take the blood, have to have the bread and the wine, which is the blood of Christ, daily. That is the only way that we could um stay delivered. And just in here that then, it just. I, I knew it and I always knew that it was right. But now, even more so, when I heard this now, I, I see more so the importance of our taking um, the bread and the wine on a daily basis to keep us um, in that delivered state. Beautiful. You know, one of the things that I learned over the years, Sister Cheryl and all others, is that when we get caught up under Greco Latin teachings, we feel, we, we put ourselves in a position where we feel 
that we don't have to do things. We could just accept it in a sort of an abstract way. So why do I have to take God and mind every day? So I do not know I have to keep connected to the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. I do not know I have to be connected to God. And what happens to people in those situations without the concrete thing, they end up slipping away from God and they don't even know. They tell themselves that. That same person could go through an entire day in front of the television watching uh, a series and other shows and not recognizing that they are violating, they are separating for themselves from God, they are separated. That same person sometimes go through a week without proper prayer or study of the Bible, and they will swear that without these things, they could keep um, connected to God. God is saying, listen, when every time, you know one of the things that has happened to me over the time we've learned these things, is that every time, I miss partaking, I'm talking at home, of the evening and morning sacrifice and partaking mm -hmm. of the bread and the wine. Mm -hmm. I am, I am, I it caused me to look back in my life to see how often I have failed in praying and studying the word of God. How mm -hmm. often I a God would say to me, pray, and I'm too busy. I'm too busy doing this, or I'm too busy doing that, or I'm watching a show and I just carelessly do it. It caused me to do that. And therefore, I my, my communication in a real way has, has really improved where God is concerned. My prayer life has improved. Uh, my consistency in meditating and studying the word of God has improved because God's system is right. Amen. Amen. Bless the Lord, beloved. Hallelujah. Let us pray. Infinite Father, we give you thanks. We give you praise. We give you the glory. We give you the honor. As we come, thanking you for the revelation of your word. Help us to make the right decision. To feast upon it day and night. As we get ready for this wonderful feast of the Passover and the Feast of Unleavened Bread and even the Feast of First Food, draw us closer to you. And may it be that these things would mean something to us and our relationship with you would be strengthened. We thank you, we bless you, and we praise you in no other name but in Yeshua's name. Amen and amen. Bless the Lord. Amen. And now may the grace of our Lord and our Savior Jesus Christ, may the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit rest and abide with us all now and forevermore. Amen. 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 Don't miss tomorrow morning. It's promising to be very, very excited. And I'll be looking forward for your presence with us tomorrow, please, God. Tomorrow, please, God, I will be talking with you uh, on uh, a beautiful topic on calling upon the name of the Lord, calling upon the name of the Lord, what it means to call upon God's holy name, what it is to call. It happened in the past and God is saying we've got to do it in the present. Amen. So you've got to learn what it is in a real way to call upon the name of the Lord. Our, our text tomorrow is so you could start to meditate uh, on it right now. Right now, you could start to meditate on it after you go over tonight's message. Is it Proverbs uh, chapter 18? I'm trying to remember uh, the exact verse. Um, it is where it says um, the that the name of the Lord is a strong tower. Amen. The righteous run into it and be saved. I think that's um, in Proverbs 18. But that would be our text of meditation tomorrow, please, God. Amen. And so when you find that text, meditate on it. Yes, it's verse 10, Proverbs 18, 10. The name of the Lord is a strong tower. The righteous runneth into it and is saved. I'll be talking to you on that tomorrow. Tell it, showing you how to run into the name of the Lord. 
Amen. And make it your strong tower. It's going to be excited tomorrow. Please, God, I look forward for Amen. that. Let us Amen. pray that God give us the strength that we need. Amen. 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 Bless the name of the Lord. Bless Amen. the Lord. Hallelujah. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night.